Hello, welcome to The Naked Scientists with me, Chris Smith, and with Kate Lamble. Hello, and this week we track down potentially habitable planets, investigate nanosuits for insects, and find out why your hearing gets quieter after a concert. Plus, we report from the British Society for Gene and Cell Therapies Conference at Royal Holloway University in Surrey. If you'd like to get in touch with us here at The Naked Scientist, email studio at thenakedscientist.com, tweet at Naked Scientist, or find us on Facebook. The Naked Scientist podcast is powered by ukfast.co.uk. Before we get into the conference, here's Ben Valsler with an update of this week's science news. This week I am joined by Dan Cleary from Science Magazine, Philip Broadwith from Chemistry World and Peter Rogers from eLife for a look at what's been making science headlines. Dan, what have you got for us? Well, the story I've got this week is about exoplanets, planets around other stars. There's an announcement this week that the Kepler satellite has discovered the best candidate so far for a habitable planet around a distant sun-like star. So it could have oceans, it could have land, it could be habitable by some sort of creature, but uh, we don't know that much about it, only that it's the right size, it's the right distance from its sun, and... You know, it looks a little bit like Earth. (laughs) So what are we looking for when we're looking for habitable planets rather than just any old lump of rock or gas? What's the the indicators? Well, all they can tell with this particular method that uh, Kepler uses, uh, because planets are so small and so dim compared to the star they're orbiting around, you can't see them directly, or it's very, very hard to see them directly. So you have to detect them by other methods. Kepler uses the method of transits, so it essentially looks at a star, measures how bright it is, and keeps watching it. And if occasionally it gets a very, very tiny bit dimmer, that means that a planet has passed in front of it. So the only information you get are about its orbit, so how long it takes to orbit uh, the star, and uh, the size of the planet, so you can tell its radius. So The stellar system that is discovered in this case has five planets that they've detected so far, ranging from half the size of Earth to twice the size of Earth. But the most distant one is the one that looks the best candidate. And they judge that by its distance from the star and essentially how much energy it's getting from the star. If it's too far away, any you know water and other gases on it would freeze out. If it's too close, it would be too hot and they would boil off. So you're looking for one that's in the middle of between those two extremes, so you're going to get the most temperate atmosphere. But sadly, we can't know if it has an atmosphere. We don't know what it's made of. We don't even know for sure that it's got a rocky surface, it could be made of gas. But it's 40% bigger than Earth, so the likelihood is that it uh, you know, could be a solid planet. And Kepler has been out there for a while now, and it's found hundreds of them. It seems to turn up a few hundred more every month, in fact. How do we now start asking the questions you were talking about? Does it have an atmosphere? Is it rocky? Surely Kepler can't do that because of the way it's looking for planets. That's true. It's not there to characterise the planets. It's there to see how many there are and how they're distributed. So to find out more about individual planets, we have to have another method. And the ideal method is direct observation. But that's extremely hard because it's like looking into the beam of a searchlight and trying to identify a firefly um, flying around nearby. And it can be done. Um, The Hubble Space Telescope and some ground-based scopes have identified a few planets, but they tend to be special cases, like very bright planets around very dim stars and in very wide orbits, so they're a long way away. But um, you need special telescopes or special satellites to get any further. Uh, Later this year, there are a couple of new instruments that are going to be attached to some of the world's uh, biggest ground-based telescopes, and they'll be able to directly image some bigger planets, but not ones that are Earth-sized. To to get to Earth-side planets, you need a specially uh, purpose-built telescope in space, and at the moment, they're just too expensive. 
Now, of course, any creatures that we may eventually find on these planets may be adapted to very different environments, which is a very tenuous way to bring in Philip. Now, you've been looking at a new way to make insects, as it happens, survive some very extreme conditions. Yes, uh, this is a polymer nanosuit that will protect uh, insects or insect larvae from the high vacuum and electron beams inside a scanning electron microscope. So we call it a, a polymer nanosuit. It does it involve actually putting a suit on the insect before we put it in the machine? Well, yes, but that's not how it was discovered. The original discovery was made because a particular kind of larvae, Drosophila, which are the fruit flies that we're very familiar with from a lot of biological studies, actually naturally produce a material on their surface that, when it's bombarded with an electron beam, cross-links to make a natural polymer nanosuit. And that's what um, Takahiko Hariyama at uh, Hamamatsu University found when they put these Drosophila larvae into their SEM. They expected them to die and dehydrate all the water to evaporate. But actually, they found that um, the larvae were wiggling around and moving for over an hour. And uh, if you want to see it, you can look at the video on the on the Chemistry World website. We've got a we've got some videos of the of the Drosophila larvae wiggling around in the microscope. So, why do the larvae do this? Do we have any idea why they would protect themselves from conditions that they're simply never going to encounter on Earth? Well, it's not necessarily likely to be designed for that purpose or evolved for that purpose. It's just a protective kind of sticky layer that protects them as they as they develop as larvae. It only becomes a nanosuit, actually, when it's bombarded with the electron beam. So if you put them into a high vacuum without the electron beam, they do dehydrate and shrivel up and die. But when you have the electron beam there, uh, the energy and the, the electrons in the beam can make the whatever's in the uh, the molecules in the extracellular substance cross-link and form this kind of polymer. And the interesting thing is that uh, the group found that if you take a similar molecule called tween, which is a uh, surfactant that's used quite extensively in biology, it acts in a very similar way. If you dip larvae that don't naturally have this extracellular substance on them into a solution of tween and put them into the microscope and apply the electron beam, it cross-links and makes a sort of man-made polymer nanosuit. So you can then look at all sorts of different kinds of larvae and spiders and crustacean larvae as well. So they've extended it to to look at all sorts of things in much more realistic conditions because obviously they're not desiccated and dried out. So you can see what these things actually look like and how they move. How big a creature could you image in this way? Well, at the moment, what the team has done is mostly sort of larvae of spiders or insects or whatever. So these are quite small. I mean, if you think of a fruit fly, that's a pretty tiny thing. So the the larva is probably even smaller. So, I mean, these are still quite small things. And, you know, if you had bigger things, you'd probably look at them with a different kind of microscope. You wouldn't necessarily need an electron microscope. So, you know, this is, I think it's going to be for relatively small things. But I guess in theory, there's not a huge limit to how big a thing you could put in as long as it's covered and fits in the, the actual equipment. Now, Peter, we're, we're going to jump back into the world of physics for you. And this one is about, again, a nanoparticle, in this case, the, the wonderful buckyball, fullerene, and its interactions with nanotubes. What have we got? OK, well, if you start at the middle, so to speak, something everyone will be familiar with, a water molecule. This paper is by two theoretical physicists using computer simulations. So everything I, I talk about is done on the computer, not in the lab. But basically, they imagine taking a water molecule, placing it inside a fullerene, which is like a mini football, 60 carbon atoms forming a basic roughly a sphere. And then, and you can do that in the lab, and that has been done in the lab, and lots of other things have been put in um, fullerenes as well. And then they put the fullerene containing the water molecule, which they call an endohedral fullerene, they put that in a carbon nanotube, which, as its name implies, is a very small tube made of carbon atoms rolled up a bit like a drinking straw. And then they model what happens if you apply an electric field along the direction of the nanotube. And they basically find that the um, the fullerene containing the water molecule moves. But that's a bit mysterious because it's it's neutral. It's you know Water is neutral and the, the fullerene is neutral, so you wouldn't expect it to move if an electric field was applied... Although, again, it's not surprising because water is what's known as a polar molecule in that the charge separates and, you know, the oxygen 
becomes negative, slightly negative, and the hydrogen atoms become slightly positive. So then that's it, it's overall neutral, but it's it's got a charge distribution, so you might affect, expect it to do something in the electric field. But what they found that was really strange was that in their simulations, as they increased the strength of this field, first of all, the fullerene containing water molecule moved in one direction, and then when the field ex- increased above a certain value, it started moving in the other direction. So that's just with increasing the actual strength. That's not changing the polarity. We're not using AC alternating current. No, no, no. It's the- literally just a more powerful or a stronger electric field. That's right, yeah. So the- basically what they say is that the um, you know, a water molecule is moving all the time. It's rotating, it's vibrating, in a- and they basically argue that the-, the energy that's sort of tied up in these forms of motion becomes converted into motion in a straight line because basically in the nanotube it can either go forwards or backwards. There's nowhere else for it to go. That's the you know their working hypothesis, but would really need to be sort of confirmed in the lab to be you know to, to be useful for anything. And that might be fairly tricky because as I say, the you know water molecules and lots of other atoms have been put in fullerenes and fullerenes have been put inside nanotubes to make what's known as nano pods. But the the electric fields you're talking about in these experiments are very high. The um, the voltage at which it changes from moving in one direction against the field to moving with the field, you know, something like half a billion volts per meter. All sorts of other things might happen <laughs> if you apply the voltage like that to sort of a, a system like this. It's an example, of, in a way, of very sort of pure research and just thinking what would happen if I took these very well understood systems. You know, nanotubes has been thousands of papers on fullerenes has been thousands of papers on water mole- water countless papers on. So it's interesting that there's still new things one can explore in such well-known systems. If you're starting to talk about drug delivery, is the idea to then start putting bigger, more complex molecules inside inside the fullerene with slightly more complicated charge distributions and see how they behave when you when you start to apply the field? Is that where that might come in? I think you could try and do it with sort of larger and more complicated molecules, but I, I think that really, really is far off. You know, and as I say, I think the it's it's more a fundamental problem where they're just trying to get to terms with the you know the basic physics and chemistry that are going on in these systems. Thank you very much. That was Peter Rogers from eLife. Before him, Dan Cleary from Science and Philip Broadwith from Chemistry World. And also this week, researchers in Sydney and in California have identified a chemical factor that dampens down hearing, causing the temporary hearing loss that we experience after exposure to loud sounds such as a rock concert. And this is distinct from, and can even protect us from, the permanent hearing loss that's caused by very long-term noise exposure. To find out more, Chris Smith spoke to Gary Housley from the University of New South Wales in Sydney. So what we've discovered is that uh, this this receptor, uh, which is called a receptor for ATP, is activated when sound levels come up in in our environment. So as noise develops, then we've found that the hearing organ, the cochlea, releases a particular chemical which binds to this receptor, and then the receptor triggers a process which is quite remarkable, which which reflects adaptation or adjustment of of hearing sensitivity. This research has identified this one receptor, one molecule, as the start of a process that uh, over a period of of 20 minutes or more with with an increase in background noise, turns down the the sensitivity of our our hearing. You said that it Mm -hmm. kicks in after about 20 minutes. So how long does the effect last for? Once you've got the diminuendo in or reduction in hearing sensitivity, how long do you remain partially deaf for, for want of a better phrase? Well, perhaps I can put this in the context of the experiment itself. So having identified a receptor, we wanted to find out what it was doing with regard to the influence of, of noise on hearing. And a drug company in the United States had developed a mouse model where those mice no longer expressed that receptor. We, we were provided with some of those mice and, and um, we exposed the mice uh, to 20 minutes, an hour or two hours of quite loud sound, 85 decibels of noise, which is louder than a lawnmower. We were expecting to see a, a major hearing loss because that's what happens with, with mice or people when, when they're exposed to these loud sounds. So the eureka moment for us was then after all this time 
in the sound chamber. We tested the, the hearing of the mice, and there was no change in the hearing sensitivity. It was beautifully acute. So noise, it had no impact on the sensitivity of the mouse. So what we then did is, of course, compared this with a normal mouse where that receptor was present functioning, and that's when we plotted the time constant for the development of the loss of hearing. And the time constant is a, roughly a measure of the time it takes to get half the maximal effect, and that's about 20 minutes. So the next question was, well, once this hearing desensitization or, or adaptation has occurred, how long after the noise is turned off does it take for the uh, hearing to return? We found by testing the hearing at uh, various times after we'd turned the noise off that the time constant is about 12 hours for recovery. And what that means in practical terms is that after half an hour of loud noise, a normal mouse would take more than 24 hours to regain its uh, baseline level of hearing. It takes 20 minutes for that protective effect to, to have at least half of its effect, the time constant being 20 minutes. Yeah. Sounds can do damage much more acutely than that, though, can't they? If you go and listen to The Who, the, loud, the loudest band in history, they're going to start playing chords that are 110 decibels from the minute their hands hit the guitar strings. So I'm surprised the system isn't faster. Well, perhaps the good news is that there are faster response systems for dealing with, with loud transients. And that's part of the neural feedback control to the hearing organ from the brain. And, and so that's called an efferent system. And that neural pathway can adjust the hearing sensitivity in the matter of milliseconds to seconds. So it's a, it's a very fast dynamic process that uh, actually enables us to pay attention to particular sounds against a, a noisy background. But that also adapts uh, very quickly. So it's, it's a dynamic response. When it comes to recreational noise exposure and you know, perhaps music exposure in the case of The Who, those very intense sounds yeah, are, are worrisome. It's, it's something that, as, as you pointed out, is, is not within normal physiological parameters for our hearing organ. And uh, yeah, there's a high likelihood that you know, it will cause damage. And one of, the, I suppose, the issues that, that our research raises is that with this natural ability to, to adapt to loud sounds, it's likely that some people will have this in, in a more effective mechanism than others. And so if, if people uh, have a less dynamic control of their hearing sensitivity through this ATP receptor pathway we've identified, then, then they may well be at risk of hearing loss because we found that with our mice that didn't have this receptor, if we raise the ante, as it were, and, and expose them to, to very loud sounds in excess of 95 or 100 dB, which is approaching those sorts of levels you talked about, then after some, some time of exposure there, they had far worse permanent hearing loss than, than the normal mouse that, that has the fully developed adaptation reflex. So before I go to my next rock yeah. concert, should I be popping a pill of yeah. something? Or is this the ultimate aspiration? <laughs> we, can, we can give people pharmacologically are defenders then? So the neat thing about these sorts of elements is, is perhaps the potential for prophylactic treatment. One of the challenges for, for noise-induced hearing loss has been that the safe levels of sound exposure you know, are defined, but people get caught out or, or they make a voluntary decision that they're going to ignore the kind of prudent guidelines. So if indeed there is that therapeutic window either to provide uh, a pill, switching on a, a pathway which can deal with, with the noise uh, stresses or, or indeed uh, perhaps other chemical stresses, then that may provide some protection. Or conversely, once the hearing damage is established, what the field suggests now is that those pathways that lead to irreversible damage, principally to the hair cells and the auditory neurons, are activated over a period of, of hours or potentially days after the initial insult. These are the challenges, I think, for the hearing science to, to identify which pathways within particular cells in the hearing organ are key to preserving hearing function.
Gary Housley from the University of New South Wales in Sydney. And that work has been published in the journal PNAS. You can find more information about that and all of the news that we've covered this week on our website at thenakedscientists.com slash news. You're listening to The Naked Scientist with me, Kate Lamble, and with Chris Smith. So, does your hearing get dampened after a loud gig, or do you take extra steps to protect your ears from damage? Let us know by emailing studio at thenakedscientist.com, tweet at Naked Scientist, or find us on Facebook. This week we're at the British Society for Gene and Cell Therapies conference at Royal Holloway University in Surrey. Earlier today, I spoke to the Society's president to find out a bit more about the purpose for today's event. I'm uh, Professor Adrian Thrasher, I'm a consultant immunologist at Great Ormond Street Hospital and I'm uh, currently the president of the British Society for Cell and Gene Therapy. This is a meeting that the Society holds every year throughout the country. What we try and do is bring together a group of scientists to discuss the latest advances in gene therapy and actually one of the innovations that we've had this year is to try and bring the, the stem cell community together because we feel that there are uh, considerable synergies between the two parties if you like. I did my PhD in gene therapy and most of the things we were writing about were things that were very speculative and in the future we might be able to. The thing that's really striking me from being here is scientists are now saying at this meeting we are doing those sorts of things we dreamed about 10 years ago. It's really coming to fruition. I think there's no question. I mean there are a number of different diseases, both rare diseases and more common diseases, including cancer, that that are responding well to new genetic therapies. So the question's changed for can we do this in a few diseases to what other diseases are targetable by gene therapy or cell therapy. What are the really big announcements or the really big developments that are being championed here at the conference? It's difficult to pin down single advances because uh, there are actually large numbers of, of what we would think of as big, big advances. So the new diseases that are uh, responding to treatment, so rare, rare hematologic diseases, rare metabolic diseases, where patients are having you know, sustained lifelong benefits. Um, in, the, in the cancer field, we're seeing uh, patients with leukemia responding incredibly well to uh, redirected T-cell therapy, for example. So uh, the, there are lots of huge advances We're becoming quite used to it now, actually. But (laughs) Well, let's hear about some of those advances. Kate Lamble has been speaking with Steve Hart, who's from UCL and works on cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is caused by a genetic mutation in a gene called the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, CFTR for short. And it affects a number of organs the lung, liver, the gut, the pancreas, and the major health problem in cystic fibrosis is the lung. So patients have very thick mucus lining the airways, and that leads to bacterial infection. Bacterial infection leads to an inflammatory response, and that exacerbates the damage to the lung. So the long-term prospects are one of a slow loss of lung function. Gene therapy, which I started working on now, this is my 20th anniversary of trying to develop gene therapy for CF. So far, unless we hear something new and exciting at this conference, there hasn't yet been a report of anything therapeutic. So in gene therapy, you're hoping to replace this mutated gene in people's cells. What's the best way of getting that gene into those cells? The challenges are to get the gene to the correct area, first of all. The lung has an enormous surface area, equivalent to at least Wimbledon tennis court. And so whereabouts in that huge area have you got to deliver your gene? It's obviously a big challenge. We've taken it that the site of delivery should be the site where CFTR is normally expressed within the lung. And that happens to be in the trachea, the bronchi, and the bronchioles, which are together known as the conducting airways. So delivery to the conducting airways is the challenge. Once you get there, however, the next barrier is the mucus. So how to get through the mucus... 
Even then, if you get through the mucus, the barrier below that, you have the cilia, which are these small hair-like projections which are highly motile. They're moving very rapidly, all in one direction, to sweep out particles from the lung. And only last year, it's emerged now that there's another protein mesh between these cilia, which excludes particles any larger than about 20 nanometers. So essentially, it's able to exclude even viruses. But we take hope from biology where we know that people do get respiratory infections. It seems quite odd to take hope from people getting sort of (laughs) respiratory (laughs) infections. How can you replicate those infections in order to transmit the gene into the cells? So viruses, you can think of them as biological nanoparticles, very well adapted, very efficient at getting genes into cells with the sole purpose of making more virus. So if we can develop synthetic nanoparticles that look like viruses and have some of the functions that enable viruses to get into cells, then maybe we can develop a more efficient system. It's one thing getting a gene into a cell, and you've talked about how difficult and how many barriers there are to that in the lungs, but it's another thing to make sure that that gene, once it's in the cell, is used and and expressed. Mm. How do you make sure that that happens? Genes usually come in a piece of circular DNA called a plasmid, and these plasmids can be switched off very rapidly. To grow a plasmid, it needs to be amplified by growth in a bacterial culture, So as the bacteria grow, so the plasmid replicates inside the cell. So you need switches and regulatory elements to control making more copies of the plasmid DNA. And a selective force needs to be applied as well, so that the bacteria need to keep that plasmid in a high copy number. And that selection is usually an antibiotic. So there is an antibiotic resistance gene on the plasmid So that's only needed for growth in the bacteria. So once you come to put your DNA construct into humans or mammalian cells, you don't need all that bacterial stuff. It's now junk. And actually, it can be quite damaging to the treatment. There are certain sequences of DNA that are recognized as as foreign by the mammalian cell, and it will cause quite a strong inflammatory and immune response. So we've been developing mini-circle technology for delivery to the lung. We're not aware of any other group that's done this yet, but I'm going to be presenting some of the data at this conference. The idea of mini-circles was to use simple recombinant DNA technology so you can still grow up the plasmid in bacteria to get large amounts of it, but then you can give them a further treatment so that they essentially loop out the region containing your gene and your mammalian switches that you want to keep. So you end up with a mini-circle that is much smaller because it doesn't now have all this bacterial junk. It's much less inflammatory, and per weight of DNA, the benefit is that you've got more copies of the gene of interest In our in vivo studies, we've found that for the same weight of DNA, compared to a plasmid, our mini-circle will give nearly tenfold higher level of gene expression. And at the moment, for CF, expression is the name of the game. Steve Hart from University College London. Now, we've just heard about how gene therapy can help to correct health issues caused by genetic mutations, but another approach looks at using whole cells instead And now I'm joined by three pioneers in this field. Dr. Robin Alley is a molecular biologist at the Institute of Ophthalmology at University College London. He's looking at ways to repair the damaged and diseased retina. Dr. Ludwig Vallier is a stem cell biologist at Cambridge University and at the Sanger Institute. And Professor Julio Kosu is a stem cell biologist also at University College London, and he has an interest in muscular dystrophies. If each of you could first give us a quick overview in just one line on what your work is. We'll start with you, Robin. Well, the the aim of my work is to um, develop a new treatment for uh, blindness that is caused by the loss of photoreceptor cells, which are the light-sensitive cells in the retina. And we aim 
to be able to replace these cells in order to restore vision. Julio, you're trying to do for muscles what Robin's trying to do for the eye. Pretty much, with the difference that for the eye you need very few cells, whereas if you want to treat a disease like muscular dystrophy that affects 40% of the mass of our body, you're going to need a lot of cell, and that is right now our major problem. And Ludwig, one way to tackle both problems might be to make cells that are the individual's own cells rather than going and getting cells from someone else that will be incompatible genetically with the individual. Wouldn't it be nice if we can make cells that are from the individual themselves? So yes, now we have a technology to reprogram the identity of adult cells into uh, stem cells, which are capable to grow indefinitely and uh, to differentiate in uh, a multitude of, um, diversity of other cell types, including cells f- uh, um, for the eyes, muscle cells. And so that means that we can generate infinite quantity of, of those cells, which will be extremely useful for uh, the cell-based therapy that uh, Robin and, and Julio just described. So, Robin, when you do your work, can you just talk us through the, the story so far, what you've achieved and how you've done it? So some years ago, we, we wanted to determine whether it might be at all possible to transplant a photoreceptor cell. Um, the rods and cones. Rods and, rod, rods and cone cells. They're one of the most specialised cells in the body, and, um, and they make um, very specific connections. We hypothesised that it may be possible to transplant these cells and have the appropriate connections. We carried out a series of experiments um, in which we looked at what stage of development is necessary for successful transplantation. We determined that it was a very specific stage which was between a fully mature cell and one not quite fully mature. And provided we transplant photoreceptor cells at this stage, they're able to integrate into the retina and make appropriate connections. How do they know where to go in the retina? Because you're literally taking a retina from, say, let's call it a donor animal, which is at the right stage of development, you're taking the cells out of that retina and injecting them into an animal with a lack of those photoreceptors. How do they know, A, to be photoreceptors and B, where to go in the retina? They are already almost fully mature photoreceptors. We discovered that injection of stem cells doesn't result in maturing into photoreceptors and, and connections. They are almost fully mature photoreceptors. They are then migrating within the retina and they, they're just recapitulating that normal development. We we're transplanting them very close to the site that they finally end up. So they're probably just following their normal process of development. And the mice, because you're doing this in mice at the moment, aren't you? The, the mice that get these cells, can they see again afterwards? So we, we carried out experiments last year in which we could show in mice that lack night vision they have no functioning rods. If we transplant new rods into these animals, that we can restore cognitive vision. So not only do the cells integrate into the retina, but they're making functional connections to the brain, and the mice are able to see in dim light. How does this work with the muscular dystrophy study, though? Because, you know, Robin's saying, well, I'm just able to put the cells roughly where they're needed to go. They don't have far to go, and they're almost the sorts of cells that they need to be. Is that the same with your approach? It is quite similar indeed. If you transplant stem cells that still do not know what they will become, the chance that they will learn how to make a functional muscle cell are very small. And if you transplant a mature contracting muscle fiber, most likely it will not survive. So also in this case, you have to transplant cells that are already committed, they have decided that they will become muscle, but they're not yet muscle. And in terms of knowing where to go, obviously you have to inject them in the right place. They don't have a map so that you can put them in the brain and they travel to the muscle. Well, if you look at, say, what a haematologist does with a bone marrow stem cell when we have a bone marrow transplant actually we do just inject the stem cells into a vein and they do know where to go they go back to the bone marrow and they repopulate the bone marrow and turn into new blood 
that's correct, but that's a, a, this is the exception. It's not the rule for the very simple reason the blood is the only tissue that is liquid, and the cells circulate. By circulating, they have to learn how to find the right signal, how to move, and how to go home. All the other tissue do not have this evolutive pressure to find their way home, so you have to put them close to the place where you want them to be. So in your example of muscular dystrophy, does this mean that a person who was going to have this sort of therapy would face a total body injection, for want of a better word? You've got to inject everywhere, or, or is there a way of doing for muscles what a haematologist does for bone marrow? There is a way in between. 20 years ago, there were trials where the cells were injected directly into skeletal muscles. But because we have so many muscle and the cells don't move much from the point of injection, this would turn out to be non-practical. What we found that another kind of muscle progenitor that can be delivered through the arterial circulation you can inject in the artery will come out of the arteries in the, if there is inflammation, like there is in muscular dystrophy. And so with a single injection, you can colonize all the muscle downstream of the artery that you are injecting. This is not 100% efficient, but it's a way to bring the cells where you want to be. What is that cell that's able to do the that? The cells we call mesoangioblast, and is a name like mesenchymal stem cell or embryonic stem cell. These are not real cells are cells that we have adapted to grow in culture starting from a specific cell type. In our case, a cell called pericyte that is around the very small blood vessel. So these cells, when you put them into the arterial circulation and they, they find themselves going through a muscle, is it the environment in the muscle that says to the cell, you should now become a mature skeletal muscle cell? Yes. Obviously, these cells once you've taken them and isolated from a skeletal muscle, will never be able to turn into a neuron or into an hepatocyte. But they have a few developmental options. They can decide to become a skeletal muscle or a smooth muscle that will form the layer around the blood vessel and will decide what to do depending on where they find physically associated. So if they get close to a regenerating muscle fiber, they will get into the fiber and will be incorporated in the newly fiber. If they remain close to the vessel wall, they most likely will become part of the vessel wall. In Duchenne muscular dystrophy, patients with this don't just manifest problems in their skeletal muscles, so they do they have other muscles in the body, including cardiac muscle. Will these mesangioblasts also find their way into the heart and re repopulate the heart with healthy cardiomyocytes then? Not the one that we isolated from skeletal muscle. There are other strategies to treat the heart, and right now pharmacological help seem to be the easiest way to go. So you're doing this in, in dogs which have a form of muscular dystrophy similar to a human. Is there, therefore, the capacity, if it works in a dog, to translate this to a human? Do you think it'll work? Well, we did it. We have a trial running in my previous institution at San Rafael in Milan, and we are accumulating results to see whether, first of all, there are damage for the patient. It's a, what is called a phase one trial. is designed to test safety and then to see whether we get some efficacy. And the cells you're using, are they the patient's own? Or no. are they from somewhere else? No, in, a, in this case, they come from an HLA identical donor, a brother, pretty much like it happens for bone marrow transplantation. So the optimal solution in both these cases would be, Ludwig, if we could get some cells that were from the individual themselves. Practically speaking, is that possible now with the science we have? Can we derive new cells for, for mature tissues? So we can, yeah, definitely generate stem cells from mature tissue by reprogramming them, by overexpressing um, protein that uh, basically brings them 
back to a more embryonic or fetal stage, basically. So you take, say, a skin cell. Skin cells, you, blood you can cells. You put some factors into it. Yes. And, and when, how do you get those factors in? So the, the most common method right now is still uh, using, in fact, gene therapy approach, using uh, viruses and, and retroviruses. So you put but, these, these four factors in. Yes. And what does that physically do to the skin cell to make it into a stem cell again? Any cell type in the body have a very strong identity imposed by uh, mark on the DNA. And uh, what we do is that we just erase this identity and impose a new one with those factors. And this identity is a stem cell identity, which gives them this capacity to grow and to differentiate. That is very interesting for regenerative medicine. And one thing you can obviously do with those cells, you can turn them into other cells, which means presumably if Robin says, well, I want to model why some of my patients get a certain type of eye degeneration. You could take cells from their skin, turn them into the sorts of cells that become diseased in that patient group, and then study the disease in a dish rather than having to go and find loads of different patients and study them all individually. Yeah, that's exactly what we, we are doing already now the past three, four years, is take you know, a sample from patient with a genetic disorder mainly, and then uh, differentiate uh, the stem cell generated from this patient into cell types that are affected by the disease. And that allows us to have, in fact, yes, the disease in the dish and do uh, studies, large-scale studies, that will not be possible to do from a biopsy or, or primary tissue from those patients. And that also allows us to develop new in vitro models to skin drug and, and other therapeutic agents. Are these cells safe? So uh, clearly those cells are like any other cells grown in vitro, they accumulate genetic modification over time when you grow them. But that's a natural process that's occurring in any cells, in vivo and in vitro. Um, but now what is really important to say is that now we have, in fact, the quality control that allows us to decide if a cell is too much damage or is it safe to be used in, in, vit in vivo. Because we can basically sequence the whole genome in less than a week for a cost that is you know, effective for, for therapies. So that means that we can really uh, you know, quality control our cells and that you know, we can now have uh, some level of safety for the transplantation of these cells. So Robin, why are you fiddling around with embryonic cells? You've got Ludwig sitting here. He can make you something from the adult. Our approach is to always take the low-hanging fruit and we start our studies with, with cell transplantation, donor, retinas, just to understand transplantation. We've subsequently started to work with embryonic stem cells in order to see whether we can derive the appropriate cells for transplantation. And that's a huge challenge because we've been able to, to make photoreceptors from embryonic stem cells for some time. What we've not been able to do until very recently is to obtain sufficient numbers of embryonic stem cell-derived photoreceptors for transplantation. That's taken a huge amount of time and effort to do with embryonic stem cells iPS cells have tremendous potential, but there are, there are still further challenges remaining with iPS cells. So I think that's maybe ultimately the most um, effective way of, of avoiding rejection to have a personalised medicine. But I think it's going to be some time before we're able to really implement um, that technology clinically. Thanks to Dr Robin Ali, Dr Ludwig Valier and Professor Giulio Cossu. This is The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith and with me, Kate Lamble. If you'd like to get in touch with any questions or comments about the therapies we've been discussing today, do email us, studio at thenakedscientist.com. You can tweet at Naked Scientists or find us on Facebook. Now, as well as gene and cell therapy, one other approach being discussed here at Royal Holloway this week is virus therapy, where the natural ability of viruses to infect cells can be hijacked for medical use, including the treatment of cancer. I spoke to Dr. Len Seymour from Oxford University. Virotherapy provides some aspects of therapeutics that have not been possible before with regular chemotherapies. At one level, and a very important level, it allows for the therapeutic agent to amplify itself at the target site. And when I say that, I mean the virus itself will replicate selectively in cancer cells and produces very high numbers. So, for example, one virus infecting a cell can go on to produce 10, maybe 50,000 copies of the virus inside the, the tumour cell, which will then lyse the cell and spread to infect adjacent cells and repeat the process. So you have the possibility to amplify the therapeutic actually within the target, which is something that's never been possible with chemotherapeutic agents 
with those agents, the highest concentrations of the drug are always present in the bloodstream on the way to the tumour, and therefore they're confounded by significant off-target side effects, so bone marrow toxicities, toxicity against hair follicles in the gut. Whereas with a virus, it really can be designed to have almost no off-target toxicities. When you're aiming for a virus to take a gene into the cancer cells, what are you aiming for it to do? Is it to kill the cells or just to stop it replicating? Well, one of the main problems with cancer, which we're increasingly understanding, particularly since we've had whole genome sequencing of cancer cells, is that they contain a huge number of mutations. So a typical colorectal or breast cancer cell carries something like 90 or 100 mutations. And so to try to fix a cancer cell like that is a, a really difficult issue. So it's very tempting to take the alternative approach, which is to say, well, let's not try to do that. Let's simply try to kill the cancer cells. So we use viruses and their ability to kill cells by replicating and lysing cells. And you have, you have also the possibility to express therapeutic proteins within the virus. So although many of our agents are simply viruses that are killing the cells as they proliferate, we can encode additional proteins at the genetic level within the virus to mediate either a, an intracellular biological effect or even having agents secreted from the infected tumour cells to affect other cells within the tumour that are not directly infected with the virus. These cancer cells are genetically identical almost, apart from these mutations, to our own cells. How do we use that virus to tell those cancer cells apart from our normal cells? Many tumour cells seem to be selectively permissive for viruses. So you do have a level of intrinsic selectivity for wild-type viruses. But then on top of that, you can use genetic modification techniques to make viruses specifically exploit the tumour. So at one level, you can introduce tissue-specific promoters, which are selectively activated within the tumour cells to drive the virus. At another level, you can take components out of the virus to make it dependent on mutations that have occurred in the tumour. There are many different approaches you can take to make viruses which depend on mutations. Do we identify a virus that's in the natural world and we think, oh, that's doing something the good, we could use that in this certain way, or do we try and adapt them and we just pick a generic virus and adapt it to what we, how we want to use it with cancer? I think that's a great question because as a scientist it's always tempting to go and look for a really interesting, clever virus that can do something sophisticated to a cell and which you can exploit. But it's also very important to keep your feet on the ground in terms of trying to translate something into the clinics. And it's easier to translate something into the clinics if there's a body of evidence about the virus already. But in the end, one of the most important things is the virus you're working with can be produced to large quantities. You need enormous amounts of material to be able to undertake a, a clinical trial. And many viruses are difficult to manufacture in large quantities. So, in my mind, adenovirus is probably the simplest and the best. We find cancers all over the body in every different organ. Is virus therapy particularly effective over all of those different types of cancer, or are some cancers more difficult to reach through this method? When people present with cancer, something like 80% of them go on to die from metastatic disease, which means the disease which is spread around the body. And so for a therapy which is going to be effective, it must be able to be given systemically. Now, viruses come into a very difficult class of agents to give intravenously because the body has learned over millennia to recognize them as pathogens. So somehow we have to find a way to persuade the body or, or engineer the viruses that they can at least achieve access to disseminated tumors now, there are several different ways you can do that. One way that has been looked at, which is quite promising, is to put a, a transient coating onto the virus to protect it during the delivery phase. Another possibility is to use a serotype of virus which has not been widely seen before and for which there are relatively small numbers of neutralizing antibodies in the circulation. So there are some tricks, but in the end, if a virus can be given intravenously to access disseminated cancer, that I think is the only way you can use it to treat metastatic disease. You're treating people with something that the body automatically reacts against. Can you harness the body's immune reaction at all? You touch on a, another really interesting point, which is the immune situation in a tumour. Human tumours, by the time they present clinically, have had normally several years to grow and adapt. So although tumours pick up an awful lot of mutations, and you would think as they pick up mutations they would become potentially immunogenic, the immunogenic variants have been weeded out. So the forms that survive in the cancer are the forms which have not got much immunogenic profile. So although there are cancer antigens, they're not normally very strong antigens. Now on top of that, a tumour has become rather sophisticated 
in finding ways to evade immune detection. It can express a variety of different pathways that will allow it to suppress the local immune system. Now, this means that there can be a situation when a virus gets into a tumour that the immune system has a level of suppression already. And this may be another reason why, on a local level, the virus finds it a reasonable place for it to be proliferative. But, of course, the virus can express components within the tumour that can modulate some of these factors that regulate the immune status of the tumour. And so I think where we dream of going is to make a virus that will, to some extent, reverse the immune suppression within the tumour and allow the body's immune system to recognise the tumour and create an anti-cancer vaccine. Len Seymour. Now here's Hannah Critchlow bringing us to the end of the show with our question of the week. This week we switch on our brain power to try to get to the bottom of a question that Wilson wrote in with. I have suffered from depression for many years. I have tried every medicine on the market, but nothing really happened. I heard about gene therapy for depression, and my question is, does it work, and when will the treatment be available for a patient like me? So, is gene therapy for depression likely to be a realistic proposition in the near future? We turn to David Porteous, Professor of Human Molecular Genetics and Medicine at the University of Edinburgh. Gene therapy has its place in the future of medical practice, but it's not a universal fix by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, it's still very much at an experimental stage. And for good reason, the right place to start is with the most severe and life-threatening conditions where the gene fault is very clear. There has to be good evidence, too, from laboratory studies that using a normal working version of the gene will work in clinical practice and a safe way has to be found to deliver it to the affected tissue. Now, with depression, there are three important reasons why gene therapy is a very long way off and may never be a viable option. First, although we know that genes play a very important part in depression, we don't really don't know yet which genes matter most, except that it's not just one gene, but many. Moreover, different genes will be at fault in different people. Second, depression is at its root a brain disorder, but we do not yet know which parts of the brain or which specific types of brain cell we would need to treat, and when. Third, there's the technical problem, getting the gene into the brain safely. So while there's a very pressing need to improve upon the treatment of depression, I do not think that gene therapy is going to be the answer. The better hope would be that we can use genetics to help identify the brain processes that are affected more clearly, and that would give us a target to aim at using smarter drugs or other forms of treatment. So it looks unlikely that depression, which involves many different genes and brain regions, could be switched off simply using gene therapy techniques. But instead, genetics may pave the way for a more informed understanding and treatments. Sticking with the subject of genetics and mood, we next go in search of solving a sleepy riddle of a question. Stuart sent this in. Hello. I'm wondering about the fact that I and two of my sons are consistently able to wake up quickly in a happy demeanour, whereas my wife and my other son have trouble waking up, no matter how much sleep they've had, and they have a somewhat less cheerful disposition. Could this be genetically based? Love the show, by the way. So, is there a relationship between rising early and being chipper? What do you think about that one? You can let us know by posting on our Naked Scientists Facebook page. You can tweet at Naked Scientists. You can email studio at thenakedscientists.com. Or you can join in the live debate on our forum, which is at nakedscientists.com slash forum. Hannah Critchlow, that's it for this week. Thank you to our guests and contributors from the British Society for Gene and Cell Therapies conference here at Royal Holloway. Thank you also to Kate Lamble for joining me this week. Next time, we're hedging our bets on the neuroscience of addiction. The Naked Scientist comes to you from Cambridge University. It's supported by the Wellcome Trust and the EPSRC. My name's Chris Smith, and thank you for listening. Goodbye.